<laughs> yeah. Hey, Greg. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Episode six. Can uh, you believe it? New year. Yes. Uh, we're yes. here. We're just a few minutes late. Thank you to everybody. Thank it's you. It's my everybody. fault. It's my fault, everybody. <laughs> well, uh, we could blame it on 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 uh, on this. I was picking up branches and everything. So yeah, oh. I was on the way down. I was kind of this morning. Yeah, cleaning up a little bit. Oh, you know, I pulled up about twenty minutes ago and uh, uh, got out of the car. Big crack. I thought it was thunder, but then I realized that it was like it, it was a muffled noise. It, it was just a tree that fell on half, just broken half, you know. And then and then this big herd. You of mean ten on the deer. way up the hill? No, just right over here. It was oh, right really? over here. Oh, not on my the, property. No, no, no yeah, okay. yeah, down the hill from there. Yeah, but the, yeah. the tree cracked, and then ten deer, very wet, scared, confused deer ran out. Uh, it was quite a moment. I heard you. He I heard a pop like that last night. I'll never forget once I heard a huge tree go over and I thought it was a rumble. I thought it was almost like an earthquake. And it, the way that it just ripped came out of the ground, the noise of the roots separating from the earth just, it wasn't the tree, it was the, the roots being pulled up going, the tree going over. Right, right, yeah, right. I think well, we're gonna see more of that now. Windfall, stormfall, right? Cause these, these stressed dry trees just, gets saturated and the water just becomes a weight on the physical structure. Of the and thing. then of course, remember the trees, many of them are compromised because of the drought. Right. So they're already uh, lighter and parts of them are dead. So they're breaking apart much easier. Right, 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 right. With all this rain. Well, you know, I've done a qu quite a bit of uh, trail restoration in my time with the saws and everything trying to get, and one of the very, the big dangers of that uh, yeah. exercise is how much energy there is in one of these trapped trees that comes down and you imagine the trees fall down like yeah. this on top of each yeah. other. Yeah. And then, and then you're, you have to work in a very specific way. So the tree does go dwang. Yeah. Of course. And, and that's, that's where the most trail restoration injuries come, come from. But what I think is amazing and it's the quality of lignin, right? The, the, the cellular structure of wood is that, is that you'll see like a, like a, a an oak tree that gets taken down by a bolt of lightning or something, it splits in half. Like, yeah, literally. In but the, you yeah. would think that that other half of the tree, because of all of that physical energy and the me the mechanics of the thing, would would you know, would would bounce back in the other direction when that happened. Like it was a release of some yeah. some sort yeah. of kinetic potential energy. But that never happens. No, it's like a saw. It's, it's like, like a saw. A, it goes right down the middle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Where it hits it. Yeah. Right. 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 But it's the, almost like us. If it were to hit us, it goes right to the heart. It gets us right in the middle. <laughs> the true. tree's the same way. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I'm, I'm worried. Uh, you know, I mean, we'll see what happens with these these elder ladies you have here. Our, I our go beautiful out girls. and that's why I clean up after them every morning. And I check to see, are you guys okay? Are you ladies okay? And they're pretty strong. They're very old, so I, I worry. And they got very dry during the drought. But, right. Um, but amazingly... OB, they're they're somehow very generous because they kept throughout the drought years they kept producing a lot of pepper nuts and I mm. felt horribly guilty that I wasn't picking them all up and using them all because they kept trying to feed us but uh, right I didn't take advantage yes, of yes you you and this <laughs> guilt you carry for not being able to use all of these great gifts yeah they're right if... in front of me and I'm going ah oh, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> our our the the our industrious industrious minds are pulled elsewhere energetically they, they are, towards all of our distractions. These uh, silly things. I know, but I've always got in the back of my mind the you know the elders and the ancestors, you know, seeing things like that and going, "Wow, we have a lot of food." Mm -hmm. And me, I'm, and then all the warnings that I used to get about, "Don't forget the old ways. Take care of the trees and all that." And when I see the ground covered with pepper nuts, I'm thinking. Ah, I'm wasteful. I'm just ignoring, you know, so I, yeah, guilt, <laughs> mm, mm. you know. Well, it, you know, uh, the idea of distraction from what is important, right? Yeah. I, I, I imagine that's where the guilt might come from. Yeah. You see that it is a very important, worthwhile thing yeah. to harvest and gather the gift that is given. It's a reciprocal relationship. Yeah, I feel rude to the trees. I mean, it's like trees. if I were to, you know, if you were to give me a gift and I'd just, you know, take it and put it on the ground and say, oh. mm -hmm. you know, yeah. without saying thank you or using it or opening it or anything. Mm -hmm. I just kind of look at it and I, I always take a few of the nuts every year and keep them in the house just to look at them. Mm -hmm. but I guess mm -hmm. just to keep feeling guilty or remembering. 
Guilt mm. is also a way to remember. Guilt is also a way to remember. Well, we're going to be talking about memory. We're going to be talking a lot about water today in today's discussion, right? Uh, you know, here, here's something writ large across the California landscape as far as water concerns, as far as memory, as far as guilt, and as far as like where we're going as a society forward in respect to the water protection movement, which is related to the land back movement too, yeah. right? This, this posture that we have towards the landscape yeah. and the distractions that we hold from what is important. And I, and I see that like now as we are approaching $3.6 trillion in the California economy, where it, we're inching up uh, to overtake Germany and you know, the, just our state alone. I right? know, isn't in, that amazing? In, in yeah. gross domestic gross domestic, domestic product, product yeah. GDP, which which is a measure of industry. It's industry that is of a specific character. Now, over the past 50 years, what we've done in California is we have decoupled our economy from water. Agriculture right now isn't even in the top 10 sectors of our economy. It used to be over 50 yeah, percent. Yeah, what I was saying. Yeah. Right? So. So we've decoupled it from water, ostensibly, because 80% of yeah. all of our water that is held up in infrastructure goes towards the agricultural sector. Right. right, right. So we are putting in a massive amount of investment in terms of this sacred substance into water. The distraction economy seems to be number one, right? Well, we've got real estate, you know, we've got, we've got, uh, we've got, Information, finance, these are the sectors that really where all of this money comes from. Real estate accounts for like $600 billion a year in California. Yeah. I mean, it's like the number one sector. Oh, well, that, and that's, that's what grows, uh, grows the gross ne the national product or state product. That's right. Call it. It's the real estate, which is growing. Real estate, it. which is land. Which is land being developed. Let's Which be is specific. land being developed and put into private property. Put into private property of and uh, concrete and all of that. As I, I'm old, I always say here to everybody, you know, I'm old. I saw that I've seen this. My earliest experiences as a young man is watching the dairy fields neck where I used to milk the cows and do all of that next to right next to where I lived, Obi. I watched the 50s and six well 60s suburbia come in and just pave over that put these suburban ranch houses which have just become ubiquitous everywhere in california right. remember with gas and oil post world war ii california just all our farmable land and open land where we could be growing food let alone leaving it open suddenly became paved housing for everybody else and we're still doing that right down below the mountain now, that mm. incredible farmland that I watched. It's all housing. Yeah. They're all building these suburbs are just spreading and spreading more concrete. And by the way, the concrete, um, all of that, it, it, it traps the water. It forces the water into drains. It's useless water, not useless, but it, it, it's water that we lose and the land no longer absorbs. Mm. The land can't be fed by the water. Once you, once you start paving things you, and putting houses everywhere, you have forfeited that kind of water relationship with the actual earth. Oh, that's beautiful. That's, that's beautiful. Let, let's be clear, though. I mean, we're not like, well, at least I, I'll speak for myself. I'm not like anti-housing. Right. Oh, like, no, like, no, no, no. Like, but I think there's ways to do housing. I think yeah. we can build infrastructure in cities and we do, and or build where we where you can't wouldn't grow food. Right. Unfortunately, we're building on the best farmland. All of the Santa Clara Valley was farmland. So there's ways. I mean, I, I'm all for I, I think, you know, housing in the city, rebuilding what we've got instead of continuing to build new, new, new. But sure, I'm absolutely we need housing. And we need to house folks. Absolutely. Well, it's amazing that this grand economy that we have is failing so miserably on the urban housing front, say. Yeah. And that that discrepancy that's inside of that industrialization yeah. of all things, including housing, the industrialization of housing, which separates so misanthropic. It yeah. separates people from the land of course yes 
and there can be no separation ultimately if you want to you know well, it, it, strive for something it, it, like sustainability well it becomes a new relationship it becomes mm. a relationship where you're not intimate with the landscape so some and, it, and it's you know it's it's a it's a home that's not on a home so you're kind of there um but and i don't want to get too political here but um Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, so much of the housing, well, the reason why we don't build on infrastructure, taking warehouses in town or uh, in cities and other structures and rebuilding them, there's not the money in it as there is in new homes. Uh, so let's, it's about economy homes. ultimately and money. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. So, I mean, so how much money is there if you're gonna build housing for people who really need housing yes. in town? That comes from grants and things. Nobody wants to take that on because there's not a lot of money in it. But build a lot of rich new homes, make mansions, and there's huge money in that. New, new out with the old, yes. right, the disposability. And isn't that isn't that related to water too? The disposability of water. Yeah. The co any everything, all commodities must be disposable. Yeah. Disposable is a function of efficiency. Yeah. And non-efficiency, you know, efficient, inefficiency is the denial of profit. Okay, yeah. so, so that's what has to change. That's, that's what has to that's change. Has the to change. myth of infinite growth. replaceability. Yeah, and growth. And I mean, growth. Uh, growth mm -hmm. of product. I mean, remember everybody, every and every politician, unfortunately, is locked in that because a politician, especially of large levels can only get elected to the extent that the economy is growing. Mm -hmm. So they're always going to be in a position of compromise with environmental issues and things like that, mm -hmm. because you can't, um, you know, you, you hear President Biden as, as much as I respect and like him, you know, on one side of his mouth, he's talk, doing great things environmentally and has done great things. But the other thing he, thing he keeps talking about is growing the economy and making sure the economy grows. Those things, in fact, uh, for many, in many ways, are antithetical unless we look for um, renewable energy, organic farming, and things like that. Right. But, but um, you know. But there's a limit to that too. There's a limit to that too. Re the, this reusable energy thing is is a is a difficult one to parse because I really see in all sectors, and it's it's really laid out in yeah. the Inflation Reduction Act, the, yeah. the largest climate bill in modern history yeah. uh, is, is in many ways, another form of wolf-like industrial, of wolf-like industry in sheep's clothing. In the yeah. sheep's clothing that is climate remediation. Exactly, because you still have corporate structure and things in there. That and, the, are and, the produce, and the production of disposable products. Yeah, I'm, I'm more, God, I'm working so hard these days, Greg, try, trying to finish my next book, The Deserts of California, yeah. which will be here in the fall. But I, I go over you this and again and again. Trying, <laughs> yeah, you're doing the, the, yeah. the follow up to the How Mountains yeah. Made. But trading nature for nature yeah. as we are raising hundreds of that R A Z E, raising hundreds of thousands of acres for solar panels have a very small, useful lifetime. Yeah. You know, and that are, that are full, full of conflict minerals. Right. Yeah, and then what do we do? How do we dispose them? We can't give as with our batteries. We can't give them to China anymore. So what are we going to do? Zero recycling. Plan. Yeah, zero recycling. It, thank you. Yeah. So it's another lie. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so I, I drilling down to these old stories. Yeah, I'm so thrilled to have another opportunity to sit here with you today. Well, you know what's so amazing is having to confront the fact that we have to break these addictive patterns okay. of more and more and more. We're a society, first of all, a people with a religion and so forth, or the main religions that separates us from home. Remember, the tenets of Christianity or Judaism are uh, uh, Jordan or somewhere over in the Middle East. It has the, the texts don't come from oh. here. So we are people that are wandering with the text from somewhere else to begin with. Then once we get here, we start, um, we're separate from this place and we don't see the ways in which we get caught into a pattern 
of more and more and more to feel safe because we weren't safe. We were strangers to begin with. Oh, okay. Who's the we in this situation? Colonizing? Yeah, the, the colonizing cultures okay. will will do that because they're a, they're they're wanderers. They're, they're wanderers, and and they're coming here. And of course, the lost tribes of Israel. Yes, it's the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, that's what the Mormons used to say about us Indians. But uh, anyway, oh, uh, right. when, when they come to uh, missionize us, they they tell us that. But uh, anyway, um, no, I mean, you've got a culture that's come here that feels entitled, remember. It feels entitled. And I think I spoke about this before. Take, take the story, if you will, let's call it a story, of the uh, Israelites being freed from slavery and going out into the desert and being promised two things happened. They were promised a home because they were homeless, mm, right? They right. were displaced. Mm. They were indigenous people displaced. God told them that they were owed a home and that they were special in his eyes. That became, I'm entitled to go somewhere and take a home. That pattern kept replicating itself. Take a home. Um, through Christianity, Mohammedism, right into colonization where we are entitled by God. We have the one right religion and we keep going and going, but then it becomes addictive because it's never enough. It gets translated finally into we're all strangers. You don't know who you live next to anymore. Mm. You, we're, no long, we're no longer a tribe. We're, we're a, a tribe of strangers to one another. And to feel safe, we need more, we need bigger, and it, it's never going enough. And we're in this addictive pattern where no matter what story, Obi, you want to believe or stick to about why and how you're here, we're in a pattern where unless we stop and say, what is enough? And if I can use this term, get sober, get sober, stop the running all the time mm. and find ourselves home right where we mm. are and begin to establish a relationship with our neighbors, with the trees, with the birds, and therefore take responsibility for where we are mm -hmm. to begin to take care of who we are, where we are. That's un unless we stop there. And it's going to take a lot because it's ingrained in us to um, addiction and materialism has become normalized. Mm. It's normal, and that's what's dangerous. So if it feels normal to us, it's very hard to, shall I say, unnormal in, a, in yourself what you're so used to. Yeah. How can this be wrong? It doesn't feel right. I, I need a bigger car. I need a bigger house. Um, I need protection you know, against my neighbor down the, the street. I need protection against uh, close up the borders. Yeah. So right, we right. have to kind of stop this, I mm, think, it, it, okay. and it's, and okay. it's going to, okay. you know, we have to check ourselves. I, you know, I, so again, I always feel guilty. Oh, Greg, you have too much. You need to, you need to come down. You, you need a smaller house. You need this, you need that. Oh, so, so that's interesting. So like this path us that you describe of imperialism, yeah. I mean, you almost that's describe like word, an, ent yeah. an entity uh, that is the, 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 the settling force that originated somehow in the in the Middle East and spread out. Of yeah. course, there were different examples of it, I mean, uh, of, 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 of conquest. Conquesting is this like ever hungry thing reflected in our own hearts. Exactly. That That is linked to, and you use this word homelessness, and that's a very interesting word. You know, I think of like, I think of like how it's become a non-relevant question. It's almost become bad etiquette to ask somebody where they're from. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no good answers for it. Any like the whole culture has. There's like this deep severing from the land. Yeah. And the people. You know this irrelevance. It's almost like, what do you mean? Where am I from? Yeah. Like as if, as if where you are from is somehow a political judgment where yeah. you are not an individual you are a representation yeah. of whatever ideology yeah. that i might perceive of that yeah. when in fact it bespeaks uh a knowledge and a responsibility as you say towards you know what Aldo leopold might call the land ethic yeah. what is good is what is good for the land and by the land i believe well said that's i, yeah, I believe yeah, that that holds yeah. all of the 
you know, the yeah. land is is also the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. The water. Yeah, the yeah. land. The land informs the air, informs the water. Right now, we're 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 in the middle of an atmospheric river. What a turn of language that is. Yeah. Really, I hadn't heard the term atmospheric river. I think I heard it a year ago. What did it, it first, about a year and a half ago river. or something? They, yeah. But right so, now we have this beautiful, have you seen the radar images of this yeah. beautiful bomb cyclone? Yeah. Like this arm is just about to hit us in the next yeah. hour and a half. Well, yeah, and it just it swirls around. From I think, the Eastern I think we're kind of in an eye right now. It's kind of calm, but it's going to... Oh, well, it's it's gearing up. You yeah. can see it right now, this uh, this brightly colored, and all the radar, radar footage and the color saturations, this brightly colored arm, this spiraling arm. It's a, it's a really well-articulated uh, Eastern Pacific storm that we're in the middle of right now that is... That is uh, coming up from the equator. That's 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 this atmospheric river yeah. that's informed by these uh, warmer temperatures. And so, what's happening right now is the El Nino, the end, so the, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is informed, which is how temperature waters in the equatorial Pacific inform weather of the world. What is happening right now is that is there's that shift. is that there's a shift from the La Nina, Nina to, to the, the El, El Nino. Nino, and this is horrifying. Yeah. This is horrifying I because, know what that means. because El Ni La Nina was is the cooling cool. effect. Is, yes. And we had the hottest year around the world. And right now, Europe's average. breaking all uh, records because it's so hot over there. Right now, <sighs> we're going to see 50 degrees Celsius. We're going to see 125 degrees. It's very conceivable that we'll so see you know that this what? summer in I mean, Europe. Think about the, the rains that we hear where we're sitting are so lucky to be getting because our aquifers, our trees are getting fed. And I do worry about point. that. This is interesting. Yeah. I do worry about the uh, this summer. Hundred. We had 118 last summer yeah. during La Nina. Right. right. <laughs> and now it's it's 120. It, we, 120. But so again, this makes you go back to this rain is a spirit. It's living. It's it's a it's a living. These storms are a living thing with a spirit. And Ooh, as in the old living. way, in an old way, this living spirit. I'm just thanking this rain. Because it is the thing that I don't want to talk about it. Uh, I'm so blessed to have the rain here <laughs> because a lot of people don't have it and they may not get it mm -hmm. and they may not be in a position to withstand what's coming. So this is an incredible gift saying to all of us in the trees, I'm coming from the sky. I'm coming from wherever I'm spinning around and I'm, I'm be thankful, be thankful, um, make an offering to me. Um, because we, as a human, I'm, I'm aware that this is a thing that will be so necessary to sustain this mountain and us right here with the coming of El Nino. That's right. That's right. That's beautiful. It's a beautiful January day. Thank you for yeah. that moment of gratitude, Greg. Yeah. That's right. We're, I mean, the, the, the earth is getting a good soaking. It's a little intense, so we're losing so much of it. Oh, in the she's runoff. strong. Right. She's a tough woman. This, this storm. She, <laughs> oh, you know, she's saying, "Listen, I'm nothing that's just going to drop on you. I got power too." Right, right, right. And right. she does. Right. But what I love now on the mountain, if you go down the hill right before you, uh, right at the bottom before you go down the last stretch to get on the main the main road off of my road, if you look to the left, you'll see when it rains this much there's a spring that actually bubbles up out of the earth. Mm. So that spring is bubbling now. And if we get more and more rain, you'll actually have a geyser that's three or four feet high out of that. Oh. And it's just coming right out of the earth. Yeah. And it, it's, a, you know, that way I know, okay, the aquifers up here are pretty full. They're that's good. pretty rare on this mountain, isn't it? Um, well, the mountain is strange because it does have a lot of water in strange places. There are streams and veins everywhere. For instance, where I am, I'm right where a strong, there's a strong vein. I have an incredible well. Where we are. My neighbor right next door doesn't. Oh, I see. So um, they had to go down much further. So um, hmm. there's the, and that's why Copeland Creek has never gone dry. Even last summer, it oh, didn't yeah, go yeah. dry because it's fed from, it got quite low but it's fed from springs that are very active in this mountain. Oh, okay. If the Copeland Creek goes dry, we're in big trouble. That means the springs are empty. Oh, there's stories in your books about that. Um, <clears throat> I, let's, let's back up. You called, you called the rain a strong woman. And yeah. I think that that engenderization, that, that uh, anthropomorphization, I'll, again, the, the anthropomorphization, Anthropomorphizing is a way of dislodging the anthropocentrizing of the world, right? Like yeah. so, 
So like, I love to think about this idea in sacred time when animals were people. Yeah. Uh, which I think is 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 some slippery language because it seems to suggest that sacred time is not now. It was something that happened a long time ago when, in fact, sacred time it's exists in the realm of the eternal. I, I thought yeah. about that. I was thinking about that last night in the news stories that I'm writing. No, we are behaving exactly as those animals that were when they were people were on that sacred time on this mountain. We're still making mistakes as conscious human beings right so we're still doing silly things the big problem is for many of us we're not remembering those stories we're forgetting and so we don't have any sense of any anything that guides our behavior or checks our behavior yes for example back again we there's nothing that's checking our greed right or what's has become normalized right we, we we don't have anything checking that but we are the same things we're st- still being like foolish coyote in the uh, you know in the old ancient times when he was the leader of the people or other people doing silly things i love this i love this what we're what i feel like this conversation is doing right now is it's entering this particular story that you and I had picked out. Yeah. Okay. The story is called Rain Finds Her Home in the Sky. And it's, yeah. it's, I think it's chapter 12 in your book, yeah. How a Mountain Was Made by Heyday Books 2017. This is the other one. <laughs> that's the paperback. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's probably how the book will look yeah. in the bookstores yes. now. This is, you yeah. know, that, this is my copy I've been carrying around for five years now. So, uh, uh, um, that's why you look so strong. <laughs> moving my damn books. Yeah, yeah I do a lot of moving my damn do, books. He does that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're backing into the themes of this story. Yeah. Which, and I think that's important from a a a narrative analysis standpoint, because I don't believe that there is. I don't believe that the moral to this these stories are actually morals. <laughs> I think that it's presenting a worldview in a way that like grim, like Grimm's fairy tales, for example, yeah. will tell you stories that have like, don't be like person X because yeah. person X did this thing. Yeah. Wherein these stories are about an establishment of truth forms that are uh, nested inside of living relationships that that gets me thinking of 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 the nature of truth yeah as as a uh, student of science as a son of science as a son of the modern world i have a particular bias towards objective reality as being somehow fundamental yeah. when in fact there's nothing that physics can tell you well perhaps arguably there is about how how and what the right way to live is in a community. Right. Here we have patterns that are uh, related to personal and political truths, political being just relationships in yeah. society and community, yeah. uh, that, that exist rooted in place and space. And the relationships within that. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. These aren't moral in the sense that, <clears throat> you know, don't have, um, inter relationships during marriage or what any th- stupid things like that. It, it's not about that. It's always about simply codes of remembering ty- kinds of ways to remember that you're not alone. The stories always remind you of the dangers of the ego mm. of the self the ego that mm. and, it, 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 and every time you begin to think about the self, you're going to be checked by the other things in nature. It's a pattern. So those that pattern keeps getting replicated in the stories okay. where characters are reminded that they're they're responsible and have to think about everything else because they're connected to everything else. Ooh, Americans so, have a hard time with that one. That, right? That's because the tough. ego is related to freedom. Exactly. Don't tell me not what <clears throat> to do. Yeah, yeah. Don't mm. tell me. Yeah, and that you're exactly right. And here it's not. It is all the ultimate freedom when you realize your home and have a big family that's going to take care of you, but start messing up with that family or using your brother and sister, they're going to remind you you're part of a family or you're going to be in trouble. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. you see, it's, 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 you, you think about it. That's that, good. That's and you good. know, um, so, so, so rain is 
you start the story with Rain as the keeper of memory. <coughs> yes. And like we have we have Christopher chiming in now about joyful to see native coho salmon spawning in Marin County's Lagunitas Creek this last week. January is a great time to see coho yes. in Marin and Sonoma counties. Yes. This is when they're coming back and this incredible amount of rain that is pushing through these watersheds right now yeah. with this flood activity. Yeah. Yeah. Salmon need the flood activity to clear out the water course. Yes, yes. And, and they're and, in the river, they're in the so creek. January right now. is yeah. the time. Talk about excellent seasonality and yeah. talk about memory too. Yeah. If there is one being, if there's one entity that understands the memory of the river best, yeah. it would be our anadromous friends, right? What we have right yeah. now is we have we have the Chinook salmon. Yeah. A, uh, a, another kind of anadromous fish. An anadromous fish is one that starts its life in fresh water, goes, spends its adult life in the marine environment, and goes back to its headwaters to complete its life cycle. We have Chinook salmon coming back to Alameda Creek for the first time in 50 years this yeah. season because of because of good engineering with brish, um, fish ladders uh, that have been, there's been a lot of restoration and remediation on that, on that watershed. But also, let's us not forget the rain. The you can do all the fish ladders you want, but if there's no water, but there's no water, right, right, right. Well, the, you know, in 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 pre-contact days or before the fur rush of the 1820s and 30s, there was a biotic solution to that, and it was called the North American beaver. The beaver, yeah. Slow it, spread it, sink yeah. it. This is how yeah. beavers deal and support uh, the watershed. Yeah. And so now, with the return of coho, it's it's always very important to remember that. This the our anadromous fish support hundreds of species, like these fish. The redwoods, for instance. The redwoods, for instance, they're absolutely on that. I mean, the way and again, that's again that whole family relationship where you might not see um, unless you've watched. But without those, the carcasses of those fish dying and being in the water later in the year, that's what fed those giant redwoods. They lived off of that. That's they sure did. They sure did. Um, now, uh, I, gosh, you know, I mean, just getting to the memory again, like they remember and the, and the fish are right there. The yeah. salmon are waiting they, for us. They remember. They're waiting for us. Yeah. It's almost as if, I mean, you and I here, I hope yeah. in this, in our, you know, yeah. singing our songs, you know, as we are here, this, this is how I sing. Yeah. I wish I could sing. I can't yeah. sing. But like, this is, this is you and me talking, looking for clarity. You know, yeah. I mean, here we are establishing clarity, you know, at the at the mouth of the river starting to go up. Mm. You and me, <laughs> if we could call it yeah. in. Yeah. If we could just if we could just have them hold on a little bit more as they, yeah. you know, perilously. Well, you know, the old people that speaking of singing, um, the old people would sing the salmon up the creek, sing the salmon. Up so the they creek. would stand and they would sing salmon songs and sing them up. Oh. And so there were all these songs <clears throat> where they would sing them up. And then, of course, the, they take some of them as offerings to eat, but it was always in th in gratitude. So, but they would, you know, sing the same thing you were, as you had hunting songs and everything else. It wasn't go hunting out and kill. It was to call the deer. So you you had songs. People had songs, but the the salmon songs were really a big tradition. Uh, even more so with the people north of us up on the northwest coast. I mean, because they were eat more salmon. But, right, um, right. But, Hold out for the Klamath dam removal, you know, yes, like that. Like yeah. if we could just get that and restore not only the environment, but restore the song. Yeah, the yeah. song is important too. the 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 interaction of gosh, what a great quality of well, life. You see those big, big dark of us. things moving mm. in the water. It is you feel it in your gut. It's an emotional thing. I mean, you feel them almost swimming in you mm. and um it's amazing Swimming to see in you. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. As if there's an identifier between us and our land. These rivers being these arterial energetic pathways, right? Yes. I mean, rivers are not things. Yeah. Right. Well, think about the blood in our body. It's just not blood. Look what the blood is carrying. Mm, just water as the is rivers. blood. Blood is water. Yes. Just as the river is carrying Mostly. these things. Yeah. You know, just, food. That's right. That's right. It, it, so, so river are not things. Just as, just as you know, our yeah. veins are linked to yeah. our person. Yeah. And I like that word, person. Person yeah. is even better than being. Yeah. Like, like person, personhood. Yeah. They talk about yeah. legal personhood. Yeah. 
you know, and this is this is directly relevant to the uh, both the um, both the uh, 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 you know the land give back movement and the water protector movement that that uh, that that seems to be gaining more popularity as a philosophy. Well, it's even better than philosophy, isn't it? It's it seems to be a way of interacting with reality. Which well, is, again, Obi, it's kind of like ch a way to check that older way of being and a way to, once again, become home to a place. It's about coming back. It's about us connecting with these things, taking a moment to stop. Let's dig through that even more. I mean, it's it's about telling the truth. Yeah. There can be no justice without truth telling. Ultimately, justice is telling the truth about what happened, what is happening. Yeah. You know, the, the, these stories are an aspect of justice in that way. Like yeah. this is yeah. this is this is a way of living true such that there is room for all of the people, yeah. all of the persons to live in health. That yeah. was another thing to talk about this week, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. health is such a taboo subject in this world, it seems. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I mean, you, you you opened this conversation talking about the pathos of imperialism. Yeah. Which seems to be unhealthy. It's a dis-ease. Mm. Uh, dis-ease, lack of ease. Oh. You know, if you're home and you're safe, you're at ease. If you're not, you're dis-ease. And that's manifesting in multiple ways. Our, our physical health, our mental health, and our addiction and need for more and more and more um so again how do we how do we get healthy what i've got that inside of me though don't i mean i work too hard i work every day all day on these things on this stuff and 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 i believe that this is ultimately capitalist this is something inside of me that is you know this is the white supremacist inside of me my shadow self that this same thing comes from as if like I am not complete enough now if you don't work enough because I bought into that. Right. Right. You and I, I, I could be better. I could be better. I'm all, <laughs> Obi, you and I, you you're, sold me you're my brother. I'm exactly <laughs> like that. I can talk about all these things, but I work seven days a week. Yeah. If I'm not, you know, as I always say <clears throat> in Los Angeles, they never ask you how you are. They ask you what you do. And I always say, well, I'm a novelist, a screenwriter, a professor, and an Indian chief. What are you? Uh, you know, and unfortunately, all those things are true. And it's neurotic. It's crazy. But um, <clears throat> I also have to know that much of what I'm doing, I hope, is for good, that I'm needing to work this much for good. The land ethic. What is The good? land ethic the, for, for good as a leader and all the, the opportunities I have. But I also realize that it's an incredible way in some ways to not deal with my pain and with my own sense of, you know, homelessness and where do I belong? I mean, all of my brothers and sisters adopted and my uh, father, my other son, all of my brothers and sisters, um, all of whom were younger than me are, are gone, um, for, mostly through bad ways, um, drugs, murder, things like that. And so there's a part of me that's saying, okay, you've been granted this life, you know, you, you, you can't just sit. So there's these things that propel me. And of course, they're connected to what needs to be done. But having said that, Obi, mm. I think it's good that whatever's driving us, you and I are trying to do things that are healing and getting people to be reconnected to health, to mm. health. Mm. And I get maybe that's a, a justification or whatever. But um, when I see my Indian people um, reconnecting with the land, with the stories that I remember that I've been told, when I see people reading and connecting, um, I feel good. And, you know, I don't want to be on my deathbed <clears throat> and have the next generation say to me, well, there's all these problems. What did you do about it? and be there and say nothing. Oh, I want to say at least I tried. That that's so inspiring to me, my friend. You know, what was that what was that 
What was the thing that I, I just read this wonderful thing? Oh, Wes Jackson of the Land Institute says, if you're working on something that you plan on finishing in your lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. Oh, eggs. Yeah. And, <laughs> and what an ego to think that you're going to fix something. You know, it's very freeing, by the way, to realize I don't have to finish this or I can't. Oh. You know, it's very freeing. You're just kind of like, wow, I can give this up. You know, mm -hmm. I, I. Listen, Greg, you don't, you're not going to get an A plus on this one. Mm -hmm. All right. You're not going to have a million seller. You're going to have something that will be connected to something else that if it's successful and good, it will continue and grow. It will continue and grow. That is, that's so good. So, so I, you know, I think about this, this land back movement a lot, you know, and, and, and not, I mean, you and I talk about like, you know, t partnering with state parks and that kind of thing. And that's, that's a very, that's a very like political policy oriented end of the land back movement yeah. ethos, you know, and that's, and that's, that's, that's your world as chairman. Yeah. So you, you have to deal with that all the time. There's this other world where here I am. Oh, I don't think I told you I did a 23 and me. I oh. did, the, I did the, uh, I did the genetic testing last month. Yes. Because you know, my family's like, you know, is there native American there or not? Yeah. There is not, any there's no native american blood quanta i have no blood quanta yeah that is that is indigenous in that yeah. way which is um interesting i mean it's it's fascinating i you know i was telling my mother about it i'm like mom it turns out you're an indigenous londoner more yeah. than anything <laughs> yeah, right so so that that's but that's a, always oh. just you know whenever i hear this you know um blood never presupposes point of view or capability. Uh, uh, I love that. I love that. So like, but the, the word like ally is popular, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, Cornel West says, uh, he points out that uh, Bill Evans, who was the keyboardist of Miles Davis yeah. for 30 years, you know, Miles Davis is keyboardist. Yeah. You know, wide as the day is long. Yeah. And he's like, he wasn't, he wasn't an ally. He wasn't an ally. He was in the band. And that, and that's like, that's, that's my, we're all in the band. And you know when we're really going to learn this mm. in 10, 20 years, mm. the discussions about how much blood Indian blood you have, or how much black blood you have or whatever, or mm. how, whether you're Jewish or not, or all yeah. of this, it's going to look like a tea party in a hailstorm. <laughs> Next to what's happening? Next to what's happening. Because oh what's gosh. happening is going to tell us we are all in the band and we forgot that we were all in the band and we better start playing together. That's what we're going to learn. There is so much truth to that, I believe, especially with the ongoing mega drought, as it yeah. looks like Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado River is going to stop producing electricity next year. And it looks like Hoover Dam might do the, do the same the year and then after what, that. And then what happens? So, you know, these things are coming up. We better learn those old stories pretty quick. We better learn those old stories. And I love this thing. We're all in the band together. And, yeah. you know, look at in my blood, my mother, my natural mother um, was German Jewish. Uh, my father was American Indian and Filipino. Mm -hmm. So if all these <clears throat> people, these races and things can get along in my blood, why can't they get along elsewhere? Mm -hmm. They're getting along and, you know, and I can't sit here and say, you know, I was raised out in nature and went on a vision quest when I was 13. Mm -hmm. No, I was like every other 13 year old around. Um, so now we, we must embrace all of this. We must embrace all of it. That's right. That's right. And, and we have precedent. I mean, largely our legal institutions are bereft of being able to, uh, they, they have no function of being able to assess the wisdom of their own actions, these yeah. legal institutions, right? They yeah. just make laws. We have this word equality, which is a value that, uh, you know, is enshrined in the institutions, whatever they are, the legal institutions. Equality does not mean sameness. And no. I, it does not mean homogeneity. And I think it's a very important thing. And it's, and it doesn't even, need to be assimilation okay being excluded because of your membership to one particular category people group whatever should being excluded because of that representation is unequal is illegal but but to say, but like men and women they're not the same but they should be 
equal, you know, and, and as far as, as race and culture are concerned, there should be enough room for that. This is the great and the same experiment with the animals in and the democracy. trees and all of that. Yes. Ah, so, well, there you go with the person argument yes. that we were talking about. Yeah. Right. But I think a democracy can be fundamentally can promote dialogue and dialogue will allow for diverse voices mm -hmm. in its best sense, democracy. Again, you talk about institutionalizing democracy and all that, that becomes a little more rigid. But diversity is essential for growth and problem solving. So if we have problems with different people here now, we need all the voices, we need a chorus. We can't have a solo singer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the chorus is where we need many voices. And so um, diversity in nature, as you know, is essential mm -hmm. as it is with people. Mm -hmm. I mean, diversity is an opportunity today. Mm. It's not, uh, it's, it's a challenge, mm. but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity today. There's, there's a great many opportunities laying around on this table, aren't there? I mean, <laughs> we just had, uh, in December, we lost P22. Yeah. A person who was a mountain lion. There's talk now of getting this, uh, getting this, this, this wayward uh, male mountain lion that got so famous for wandering around a nine square mile area of, which of northern small, Los yeah. Angeles, which is extremely small for a male yeah. mountain lion. Yeah. Um, let, yeah. So let's, as we're sort of wrapping we up here, super I love her mama here. And you love she was Super 15. Mama. She was very she old. She was P1, right? These, P, yeah, these, these yeah. designations are from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I think, yeah, we call wildlife. her Super Mama right here because she had Super all Mama. these. Yeah. She made three litters with P5, yeah. a cat known as Hannibal. Yeah. Right? One in, uh, uh, let me see, I have, I have the notes written right here. So, so she, she kept that same man. She was monogamous. Right. <laughs> she, she, yeah, that's right. Well, I, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, Hannibal was really, really making sure that that was... Uh, going to stay that way. Um, well, no, I think she's the boss. Remember, the oh, females, she's... they decide. They're the ones that let the male come around. So. I, I don't know that much about oh, the yeah. mating habits um, of the mountain lions. But you saw a kitten a couple yeah. recently, huh? Just down the road here, um, one night, I was just just within walking distance here. It was right on the road. The, my lights blinded it, and it <clears throat> crouched down. And it was amazing to see. Um, it was probably three months older when, however, they would be at this time, but uh, it wouldn't get out of the road. And of course, OBI, this is what I love. This is the power of nature. We can't, I wouldn't dare get out of the. I had to sit there and wait for that kitten to move because I didn't dare get out of the car because the mother would probably be in the bushes and I wasn't going to try to shoo her kitten out of the way. Right. So right. Um, I had to sit there and be patient, but God, I, no, I that's got a good policy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, when we were talking last week, I mean, there, there is a, possibility that that was super mama's cat because she was put down a month yes. ago yeah just but, in bennett valley right over the ridge here. right right, right over so, the ridge but didn't you you yeah, were the one that she told hasn't me had you thought a she litter. was too old she hasn't well she i mean this cat was 15 to 16 years old yeah which is about as long as mountain lions live yeah. she had a litter in 2016 and 2017 and 2018 was her last one that we know about yeah okay so i you know if you didn't see it, it I just find it unusual that you didn't see mom close because well, the and the kitten had been around here. I saw it again, and so did my neighbors. In the neck, the for the next few days, we saw it here, mm -hmm. and somebody thought that it was sick, and they, uh, but then it disappeared. So mm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it was hungry or without the mother. I was concerned. Well, wouldn't it be interesting? I mean, I think that I think that what P twenty two represented its popular, its popularity, its virality is is another opportunity for you know to let it be this bellwether to let it be this threshold but where we, we we let's engage our let's engage the naming activity right the individualization the personhood the the recognition because that that certainly does anchor the personality and and it really changes the paradigm although there is precedent for it before yeah. i think of martha who was the last passenger pigeon yeah. In 1914. It, wasn't that a, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. When there story. had been so many. The skies were, uh, the sun was blinded by the flight of the passenger pigeons. It's astounding to hear the accounts. Billions of passenger pigeons. There was an area in Wisconsin that was a nesting site 
that was 800 square miles of like just passenger pigeon nests. And there might be 20 nests in one tree. They have a very, they, they built very clunky nests. Yeah. And a passenger pigeon is about, uh, you know, 50% again, the size of a, of a, you know, rock city pigeon that you yeah. would see yeah. a rock dove yeah. that you would see these days. Yeah. Passenger pigeons were a little bit larger, uh, but we got so good at killing them. I mean, you think of the, even the, the word stool pigeon, which is which is a technique of, of strapping a passenger pigeon to a stool. Yeah. And then they all come around because they think there's food there. Yeah. And then you can net and kill 75,000 of did them with in the one. Buffalo, in one. Running them over the cliffs and things. Very much. A, it's a fascinating story how again and again, how American colonial society over the past three, four or five hundred years has transformed wildlife into industry. Well, and how quickly that can uh, decimate a species. Um, here, again, with the massive wetlands that we had, the waterfowl would fly up into the air and the, it would be dark for an hour or two at the time. Mm. The skies mm. were so full. We also had great swarms of monarch butterflies, so thick coming through the valleys here that people had to shield themselves and get in their houses because they would be just, they, they'd be all over them, that you couldn't move. In fact, Mariposa, which is butterfly, that's what happened to the Mexican soldiers who were marching through there. They got caught in one of those migrations, waves of these butterflies, and they were suffocating because there were so many butterflies. The old stories that almost has a sacred time quality to it, doesn't they do. it? You Magic, know? yeah, power, amazing. Back back then yeah. when this happened. We'll see, yeah, there, are, there are circles, there are cycles. Uh, we are, we'll see what this next mega drought actually is as we are dealing today with the bomb cyclone that is hammering Northern California right now, today, January, episode six, place and purpose. We're going to experience increased precipitation and increased snow drought. Remember I was talking about the drying up of yeah. the dams in the Colorado yeah. river. Yeah. So we have increased precipitation and increased aridity, which is very counterintuitive, just like the old stories that you put in your book. Yeah, it's, a lot of them are counterintuitive. Yeah, they, they, they're they totally. But you know what I keep thinking? Nonetheless, and I don't want us to lose this point, just as we lost the, the pigeons, of course, but there's still a monarch butterfly and there's still a, a coho salmon. And given the right situations, they come back I believe they can come back nearly as fast as they were lost. So that's what I have to keep thinking about. Let's those keep singing our songs. Those, those, those coal are coming up the creek, right? They're in the Russian River. They're moving all over the place now. Um, so they're out there and they're waiting just as the trees are back to the guilt at the top of this conversation. <laughs> the trees are saying, I'm still feeding you. Mm. Do you still want to eat? Mm. The salmon are there saying, I'm still here. But you have to make a deal with me. We're going to take care of each other. Oh, that's beautiful and a great note to end on. I think I think we've been talking here for about sixty minutes. And oh wow! I okay. think we're gonna we're gonna put a bookmark in in, in this uh, in this. We story never have enough time. I mean, OBA. Um, of course, I poor people. We uh, never have enough time. Uh, I, I'm really honored that people uh, and humbled that people want to sit here and listen to me uh, go and you go on and on about these really important matters. It's such uh, a gift. And I hope that uh, uh, we spur, create questions and uh, help people extend the dialogue that we're having to mm. the world. I mean, um, sort of a, sort of a, sort of like rain. Mm. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Until next time, we'll see you in February. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.